Now it's my pleasure and honor to uh, invite one of the most renowned uh, ophthalmologists uh, globally, Dr. Rajesh Fogla, sir, who will be talking to us on how to approach a patient who has Fuchs dystrophy and cataract. Thank you, Shail. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it, it's always been a privilege being part of your course. And this is quite an important topic. I have no financial interest in this subject. Fuchs dystrophy is not uncommon, it, you do see in your clinical practice, and it's important that besides looking at the cataract, which is the most obvious finding, you do look at the cornea, especially the posterior aspect of the cornea, and see if you, whether you can identify that orange peel kind of appearance. Fuchs dystrophy typically uh, occurs in the age group 55 to 65 years, and it does have a uh, family history as well. Uh, you can see on anterior segment OCT an increased thickening of the decimus membrane and also the overall thickness of the cornea increases. And if you do a specular microscopy, you will see those dark spots. Patients can have symptoms of glare, decreased contrast, blurred vision because of Fuchs dystrophy, but these are symptoms which are similar to what you get with cataract as well. But if your patient typically says that when I get up in the morning, my vision is blurred and it gets better during the course of the day, keep a watch for, uh, you know, whether the patient has a Fuchs dystrophy. Uh, corneal tomography can help identify early Fuchs dystrophy, not only by looking at the increased thickness, but also if you look at the posterior elevation map, you will see a posterior depression, which is again because of when the cornea starts becoming edematous, it affects the posterior corneal curvature much before it starts showing up the microcystic edema. The cataract management, uh, you can have loss of up to 8 to 10 percent of endothelial cells, and this is dependent on the cataract density, the anterior chamber depth, and the pupil dilatation. And a study where they looked at a cutoff value of 640 microns and they performed cataract surgery, uh, the corneas which had a thickness of more than 640 microns, um, uh, almost 22 percent ended up with keratoplasty. So the advantage of doing a cataract surgery alone in the presence of endothelial disease is that you can avoid all the complications which are associated with corneal transplantation. You don't need to pay, put the patient on steroids for long term, so thereby avoiding glaucoma, the risk of rejection, and you don't need to see them too frequently. But as it's a progressive disease like the Fuchs dystrophy, you will have visual deterioration over a period of time. What kind of surgical technique you will perform? Ideally, most of us do perform the phaco emulsification, but if the cataract is very hard, and if you're not confident with that, I think a manual small incision cataract surgery or an extra capsular cataract surgery sometimes works better in this scenario. In very eyes which, which have shallow anterior chamber, and this we have learned from our Japanese colleagues, that you can do perform a limited anterior vitrectomy, which can in, help increase the space in the anterior chamber and thereby make it safer for the cataract surgery and reduce the risk of damaging the endothelium. Uh, if you know that you're going to go in for an endothelial keratoplasty, always aim for a little bit more myopic than minus 0.5. I would say that you aim for minus 1 or minus 1.5. Don't choose a hydrophilic IOL because when you do a endothelial keratoplasty and you use air or gas tamponade, the reports of opacification of hydrophilic IOLs have been reported. So use uh, the hydrophobic IOL, use a monofocal lens, a multifocal may not be the best because you may not be very accurate with your IOL power calculation. I would prefer an extended depth of focus lens. And uh, during surgery, yes, these, the decimus membrane attachment is not very, uh, you know, firm. So use sharp knife, use dual OVD uh, using the soft shell technique, use the BSS plus and avoid any kind of intracameral medications, you know, because the endothelium is already not very healthy. And if you put any kind of intracameral, you know, antibiotics or dilating drops or anesthetics, they can be detrimental to the health of the uh, endothelium. Uh, don't try to be too aggressive with your wound hydration because here the attachment of the DM is not very firm and you may induce a DM detachment in that scenario. If you do have a leaky wound, I think I would prefer to just place a suture rather than hydrating the wound. And near the wound, you may have a greater tendency of having a small DM detachment. So at the end of surgery, putting in a small air bubble in the anterior chamber is always helpful. So if you have anywhere small DM detachment, this air bubble can help uh, secure that back in place. You may need to use steroids with greater frequency because these are patients on day one post-op. They may have some corneal edema, so uh, 
plan and tell them preoperatively that your vision on day one may not be very clear. You may need to use some, uh, you know, medications for a longer period of time. Use topical hyperosmotics. Measure, uh, monitor the IOP because raised IOP also uh, reduces the function of the endothelial cells. Watch out for DM detachment. If there is edema, do an anterior segment OCT because on slit lamp examination, sometimes you may not pick up those shallow detachments where OCT you can pick up. And the corneal edema, usually uh, before you jump in and recommend uh, uh, endothelial, because I get patients referred two weeks, three weeks after cataract surgery with diffuse edema, saying that it's not getting better, do an endothelial keratoplasty. But I, unless you have, you know, removed the DM, then it's fine. Then there's no point in waiting. But otherwise, I think eight to 12 weeks is uh, a usual time where we, before we go ahead and plan for any kind of endothelial replacement surgery. Well, there's increased risk of endothelial failure if there is already pre-existing epithelial edema or you see presence of folds in the posterior cornea or if you start seeing sub-epithelial fibrosis or the gutte, instead of being limited to the center, you find that these are extending all the way to the periphery. Then you know that this is a more advanced uh, form of endothelial dystrophy. Uh, so basically, you can use both the pachymetry and the cell count as uh, uh, the markers. I would say that if somebody has a thickness of more than 650 and cell counts of less than 800, maybe going ahead and doing a combined surgery makes more sense. But if the pachymetry is less than 650 and you find that the cell counts are maybe 1,000 or more, you can still go ahead and the cataract is not very hard and you can do a comfortable surgery. You can always do a sequential surgery where you do the cataract surgery first and come back and do a corneal surgery later. If the gutte are limited, on only to the central four millimeter, five millimeter area, because in a young patient that can be, you can think about doing a isolated stripping of the decimus membrane only in the central area. And then post-operatively you treat with steroids and rokinase inhibitors like riposidil or netarsidil. And you find the peripheral endothelial cells over a period of one to three months can migrate to the central cornea and you know clear the corneal edema. The only disadvantage is that the moment you do the procedure, the very next day the patient will have a dense central corneal edema which will take uh, one to three months to resolve. So you need to uh, counsel the patient for that. In our kind of clinical practice, because uh, we don't operate on like patients with 6669, we don't see those patients. Uh, but in the West, they have been doing that and they have been successfully able to manage that. But this doesn't solve the problem long term because down the lane, several years later, they will still have progression of the gutte and they will require endothelial keratoplasty. So you can see that, so you can have preoperatively a lot of gutte or you can have the post-op. So in this kind of scenario, you can do the endothelial keratoplasty, whether you do a DSEC, ultra-thin DSEC or the DMEC. DMEC is now traditionally uh, the preferred technique in this scenario because it gives better refractive outcomes and faster visual recovery and it has the lowest risk of uh, rejection. And it can be combined with cataract surgery to give more predictable refractive outcomes. Uh, studies have looked at uh, performing a combined surgery and they found that combining the two procedures does not uh, increase the risk of post-operative complications. We can do surgery sequentially very fast, like I did one eye of phaco DMEC and within a week I was able to go back and do the fellow eye phaco DMEC as well because the first eye had recovered and it just happened that we had a pair of tissues, so we, I used the same pair of tissues, it was kept in optisol, so I, one week later I went and did the other eye as well. And even this is a patient uh, who had a non-resolving uh, edema following cataract surgery. So here also you go ahead and do a DMEC. And you can see that uh, the, the eye looks pretty much like uh, if somebody examines the eye, they won't be able to f figure out that uh, endothelial keratoplasty has been done. Even in fakey eyes with DMEC can be done initially because this is a young patient, 40-year-old with Fuchs dystrophy. So we went ahead, did the DMEC first, and later on now, if she develops a cataract, you have a better chance of choosing an IOL, whatever IOL, whether you want to put a toric IOL or even if you want to put a multifocal in this scenario, you can do so. There are some surgeons in the West who prefer to do a sequential surgery. They do an endothelial keratoplasty first because they can do a better IOL power calculation when performing later. And uh, you do get a little bit of hyperopic shift with DMEC as well, and that's something to do with the rate of clearing of corneal edema. The central edema clears faster, which makes the posterior curvature more myopic. That's why you get a hyperopic shift. When the peripheral edema resolves, this hyperopic shift disappears. 
Uh, this is a study where they did uh, fake ICDMEC and later on when patients developed cataract, they went ahead and did a cataract surgery and they did find that the endothelial cell loss from the cataract surgery was not very significant and the majority of the eyes achieved 20, 30 or better and the target refraction was within plus minus 0.5. So, well, if you have fuchs dystrophy with lens changes, you can plan for cataract surgery alone and plan for endothelial keratoplasty uh, later. You, if the gutae are limited to the central cornea, you may just do a, a decimal stripping only, or you can combine the two procedure. Or if it's a younger patient, cataract is not significant, you can think about the, doing a DMAC. So this is a flow chart that kind of uh, covers whatever we have co uh, spoken about now. So you have newer diagnostic methods to uh, quantify the corneal changes in fuchs dystrophy. The choice of procedure also depends on the patient's expectation. Somebody does not want multiple surgeries, you can do a combined procedure. Or if somebody wants perfect refractive outcome, wants to go in for multifocal, maybe you can do a endothelial keratoplasty first and three to six months later, you can go ahead and do a, a, a premium IOL surgery. And the, in future, we may have cell-based therapy where you don't even need to uh, put in a cornea transplant. You may be able to inject cells just like you inject your anti at the end of surgery. You just inject cells into the anterior chamber, patient lies face down and uh, the endothelial problem is resolved. Thank you, thank you for a patient here. Th thank you, sir, for that excellent, excellent overview. Sir, I had one question that if uh, if if you have, if we find clinically that let's just first go for cataract surgery and later if it decompensates, we'll do the DMAC, DSEC. Uh, <clears throat> in such eyes, would you start them post-operatively or starting pre-operatively on rho kinase inhibitors? Or? Well, it's not very clear what exactly rho kinase does. So from the understanding what we have from, see all these uh, rho kinase inhibitors currently which are, are approved for management of glaucoma. And what they have seen with decimus stripping only is that it increases the uh, mobilization of cells from the periphery to the denuded area. Uh, people have used it, but if there is presence of any kind of epithelial edema and you use a rho kinase, it actually makes it worse. Mm -hmm. Okay. But yes, uh, in combination with steroids, if you want to use rho kinase inhibitors to kind of allow the peripheral cells to start migrating to the center, it can be done. So and we, sir, we any don't have an exact to... answer, but yes, correct, correct. It, it, post-operative, it's an option. But I have also seen or... patients after cataract surgery, when they are started on rho kinase, they come back, come to me faster yeah. for <laughs> endothelial keratoplasty okay, because okay, they sir. become visually more symptomatic. Correct, correct. Absolutely, sir. Wonderful, sir. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience, uh, okay. I have a question, yeah, sir. Sure. Uh, post DMEC, uh, when you uh, in fake DMEC, uh, when you go in for the cataract uh, surgery, what is the soonest that you can go, and what is? Uh, well, I, I and do you have a backup uh, DMEC tissue ready in no, case we, it we, uh, moves? The, the or the graft is not going to separate on its own. It's quite firm. Firm. So you don't have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. But yes, you would do a speckler count before you embark on your cataract surgery and see what kind of cell counts you have, look at the corneal thickness, and do have a word with the patient and tell them that, you know, in the worst possible scenario, if your cornea doesn't clear after the cataract surgery, we may have to replace the DMEC donor. But so far, the cataract surgeries I have performed after DMEC, we have not had a significant amount of endothelial change. Hmm. Because our surgeries, the cataracts are not very hard, it's more of the posterior subcapsular cataract and you're able to manage them pretty well. But yes, the earliest I, I would recommend is maybe in a month's time is when you can do that. But ideally, you would wait for topographic stability to allow you better IOL power calculation. So at least three to four months. And would you change your viscoelastic for the cataract surgery? I would still use the same, uh, uh, both a dispersive and a cohesive, cohesive. just like you do for, for the compromised routine. endothelium. Thank you. Thank you very much to the audience. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, so as I said, keratometry is the most important uh, measurement for a good biometry. Uh, when you do the keratometry, you have to also find out whether it's a regular astigmatism or an irregular. For that, you will need to do an additional, uh, at least an additional investigation of a topography. So if the pterygium is inducing irregular astigmatism, we wouldn't go ahead with a toric IOL or even a aspheric. Probably a spherical would be a better outcome. Because if it is an irregular astigmatism, if you're leaving behind any uh, refractive error, 
uh, a spherical IOL tolerates that refractive error much better than an aspheric IOL. So I think uh, we will take the question uh, downstairs because we have to clear the podium for the next session. Thank you so much.